So welcome, this is the talk Beyond Where and Grubai, and it'll be in English. So first, uh, just very quickly about me. So my name is Ria Lubczyk, I work in Marriage Corporation, and yeah, I won't read that, but I was working on this code base since 1998. That's one problem that I know about myself. When I get excited, I tend to start talking. I, I, that's everywhere in every room. So when I get excited, start talking very fast. So don't get just to shout to me, and then I'll talk, start speaking slower, or just ask, interrupt me anytime and ask if anything is not clear. So <clears throat> let's start the talk from stuff that everybody in the room, I hope, knows. This is. And this stuff we introduced in SQL 86. And this is just just normal select with from where group by having or by limit as non started so it's not on the slide. And that's everybody knows that people are using that. It works. Businesses make money, everything's fine, but really this is SQL 86. This is the great time of I don't know, quick basic and DOS 3.2. I don't think anybody's using this nowadays. So why limit ourselves to standard from the 86? Probably some people in this room were not even born back then. So let's see what uh, new features were introduced since the old days of 1986. The next uh, interesting standard was SQL 92, and it introduced the concept of set operations. Really, the result set is called result set for a reason, so it's a set of rows, which actually means if you need some specific order, you need to use order by because set is an ordered set of rows. And because it's set, we can do set operations with the different result sets. We can do union, which again, I hope everybody knows because it was in MySQL for a very long time, since like the year 2000 or 2001. And But I still just for, for completeness, I explain what it is, so there are two tables, one has rows 1 to 3, and the second one has rows 1, 11, 21. And then union will contain, it's a union set, it will contain all, all rows from both result sets. And if we draw circles like in kindergarten, which is actually called Venn diagrams, then you can see that the first circle contains numbers 1 to 3, and the second one contains 1, 11, 21, and the union contains all five numbers. But there were other two set operations introduced in SQL 92, which were not in MySQL back then. And they on, appeared only recently in MySQL 10.3. That the latest J version of MySQL became J like in end of May, I think. Yeah. So again, inter intersect, it shows only those rows which are present in both result sets. It's a set intersect. And in the Venn diagram, you can see that's only one number belongs to both circles. And that is only one will be part of the result set. And there's third operation called accept. Again, implemented in MariaDB 10.3, it's a set difference. It shows all the rows or all the numbers which are part of the first circle or result set, which are not part of the, not, don't belong to the second circle or result set. That was easy there. Next, our oh, big SQL standard was SQL 99. It introduced an interesting concept of common table expressions. At first, a short disclaimer. So this is talk is called beyond where and group by, so it's about uh, where group by and stuff, and about querying data. So trigger, storage, procedures, all this stuff, merge, everything to modify the data, it's beyond the scope. I'm talking only about select and about stuff that, how to query the data. So what are common table expressions? To explain that, I'll start first from the, again, feature that existed in MySQL for many years, which were introduced before SQL, 9, before SQL 99. This is subquery in the from clause. And in these examples and on the following slides, this is some table called employees of employees on some fictitious database company. You won't select those engineers who know something about the optimizer. This is query where I select from employees where department equals engineers. And from those engineers, we select those whose expertise includes the area of expertise includes optimizer. And the same query can be rewritten using the common table expressions like that. And just to compare, this is the first one is subquery in the from clause. The second one uses common table expressions. This is the subquery in the from clause, and this is the common table expression. So it's really just a different way of saying the same thing. It's nothing particularly novel in here, 
although it does have some readability benefits. For example, let's imagine from those people who know something about optimizer, we want to find those who can speak German. Then you would need to wrap this query in yet another, make it yet another subquery, and then select from those optimizer guys, those whose language is German. And this is actually it looks pretty simple on this slide, but if you think of some, I don't know, real world example query where each of the subqueries is like four screen long, then it's getting very difficult to read and they're getting indented. And if you look at some any particular screen, you don't even know what subquery it belongs to. And then you need to scroll back and forth to find, find the boundaries and parents and so on. And with, sub, with common table expressions is arguably easy because they defined each, each one after other, not nested like temporary views. Like this one introduces a view called engineers, this one introduces another view called optimizer, and after the main query, all views kind of disappear. That's another way to think of commentary expressions as of one-time views. Another even better benefits in case in terms of readability is when you need to join such a subquery to itself. Like in this one, we need to find a reviewer for some code. We need to have a matching area of expertise, so we need to select twice from the sub from the table in place, then joined with itself. And again, this looks easy, but if you think that of every query being four screens long, you'll have eight screens of almost identical queries, or maybe exactly identical. And you scroll back and forth all the time, comparing, trying to understand whether it's actually the same query, or you just have a couple of characters difference on the screen two and six. And this one is shorter because subquery is not repeated, and one can clearly see that it's subquery is joined with itself and not with similarly looking copy of itself. So it's much more readable. Now, how a database engine would be executing su such a common table expression? The first approach, the probably the best one, and it can be, it works not only with common table expressions, but also with views and with subqueries in the from clause, is called, um, it's called merge, where the subquery is, sub where this uh, CTE is sub, the subquery is substituted in the main query, and then the result will look like this. There's no any subquery anymore, and optimizer can see all the tables and join them in the any order, and then optimizer can select the best order based on whatever magic optimizer is doing. That's the best possible approach, but it is not always possible. Here you can see uh, I modified the query a little bit in case I added group by here, and with group by the subquery with aggregation cannot be merged anymore. So the only thing the optimizer can do is to execute this subquery separately, store the result in a temporary table, and then use this temporary table in the main query. And here you can see that subquery is used actually twice in the main query. So it'll create one subquery for the v v1, then a second subquery for the v2, and then it'll join those. And it's pretty easy to see that there's a lot of a lot of work is wasted. There's totally no reason to repeat the subquery twice because it's the same thing. So the first uh, an obvious optimization to do here is to call temper table reuse. That is, temper tables is created only once and then it's joined to itself. This is then optimi optimization that MySQL 8 is doing. MySQL 8 has introduced, supports common table expressions now and they have implemented this optimization. In MariaDB we don't have this optimization because this is still, this subquery is still doing a lot of work because it creates a huge temporary table v1 by aggregating all the rows from the original table t1 while in fact later it throws away almost all rows from this table and only selects rows for specific values of b. So there's no need to create this huge temporary table aggregating the whole t1. What we can do here called a condition pushdown. We take those two conditions and we apply them not after the aggregation, but during the aggregation as early as possible. So we still create two temporary tables, but instead of two huge temporary tables, or instead of one huge temporary table, we create two very small temporary tables doing much less work than either of those two previous examples. And in the main query, there's no more condition because we applied it earlier. There's uh, alternative optimization. This, for example, is implemented in SQL Server not only in MariaDB, it's not, we didn't invent this one. So those are different ways of implement, of executing a common table expression. Still, 
besides all that said in implementation, commentary expressions, while they, pro they do look simpler to read and to, to write the commentaries, usually less code, they're more readable, but it's nothing particularly novel or interesting about them, and I wouldn't be talking about them at all if not for recursive common table expressions. Recursive term and common table expressions, they look similar to non-recursive, but in fact, they are completely different. They allow new possibilities. It's not just a different way of saying the same stuff that you could have, been, could have said before. And this is an example. This is first, this is anatomy of recursive common table expression, how one writes such a query. So there's a negative keyword recursive in the definition of CT. Then, then there goes a first select, which in this talk I'll be calling a bootstrap select, just, a, just some select like in any other non-recursive common table expression. Then there goes a union all, and then there comes another select. And now that another select is defined, is using this same common table expression that it is actually defined. So it's defined using itself in a recursive way, and that's why it's called recursive common table expression. And at the end, yes, there's a select that selects from this recursive common table expression. What, what does this all mean? What does this, what does this SQL mean? How would, it, they, how would it be executed internally by the engine, by the database engine? First, the engine executes the first non-recursive part of the CT, the bootstrap select, selects for folks where name equals Sergey and selects, well, it selects me. Then it executes the second select, and at this moment, the value of ancestors is just one row, so it joins this row with the table folks using the table, yeah, using ancestors, and finds my father and mother joining with the column ID. So it finds two rows, and using union all, it happens those two rows to the already found result. So it happens two more rows. Then, and then they become, starts the interesting part, it repeats this select again, the second one, using those two new rows as the values for ancestors. And then joins those rows with the folks using ID and finds, well, fathers and my parents of my parents, so it finds my grand grandparents. And then it repeats this select again using those four rows as the value of ancestors and find eight more rows. And so on and so forth, it continues joining and repeating until the table is exhausted and it doesn't find any more rows. So what do we do here? We've selected the whole genealogy tree with a children and parent relationship with one select query. This was totally impossible with a standard SQL select until com recursive common table expressions were introduced. Yes. Yeah, so parallel grandfather is father of the father, this is father, this is mother of the father, and so on. No, this table folks it contains lots of different people and for everybody it, it for every person it contains the ID of their father and mother. And then it joins traversing the table. There, there was some row in the table which contains this number as in the column father of this row. I didn't show. There should be a, a column father and it would be saying 892. And during the join, it would find this row. Okay. Another question? Yes. This was a loop. If you build an infinite loop, then it'll never end. Um, there might be some variable for that, I don't remember. So you can just kill the query. Okay. okay. Make a mistake in my database, yeah. It's just a select, so it, mo it, most, it won't destroy the data. It's pure select. So what, okay, so what uh, recursive table expressions are useful besides doing genealogy? So they're useful for generating the data. The very first simple example is Fibonacci numbers. So we create, a, we start writing a recursive commentary session called Fibonacci, and we start from first 
two values will be in one and one, and every next row is the new A is the old B, and the new B is the A plus B. And we stop when we reach 2000. And if I'll execute this, and actually did execute it and co paste it into the slide, you'll get the, oops, you'll get the familiar sequence, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, and so on. But actually, I don't think you will need to generate Fibonacci numbers in a scale, but practically what could be, this could be used in various reports. For example, you have an attendance table for employees in a particular company, like a factory, or I don't know. And you want to see on what days a particular employee didn't come to work. So how do you do that? Normally you would need to have a table of all working days, then you do a left join of the table of all, all working days with the tables on, with table on what days employee came to work, then your if is null and so on. Then you see what, what rows are null. So you need to do a left join with the table, pre-generated tables of all, all working days. You can pre-generate the table of all working days in your application, like in, I don't know, Python or, God forbid, PHP or whatever, Java. But with common table expressions, you don't need that because you can generate a table of all working days on the flight and, and immediately join with it. This is how you do that. Uh, this is example how to generate all, of, of all working days in the year 2010. So again, we start from the January 1st in here, and then every no next row is previous row plus one day. And we continue this exercise as long as we stay within the year 2010. 2010. So after executing this common table, common table expression, we'll have all the possible days in the year 2010. And then in the, in the select, we simply select all the working days, that is, from Monday to Friday. And then you'll have the table of all working days. You can join it directly with the ta attendance table. Do a left join, then you'll see on what day somebody didn't come to work. So this is useful in reports when you need to generate this kind of data, because you can do that on the fly. And the last example, a bit more complex, it's a social graph example, this social network, or Judging by the size, it's more like nano social network. It's a very, very small one. There are two tables with us of users and table friends specifying who is friend with whom. And let's say we want to find a chain of friends between Chris and Jason. So we start writing this recursive con to common table expression. And we start first select, select Chris. And then we will use the username to accumulate the path. And Every, in every next row, we join the previously found row through the table friends with the table users to find the next friend of the previous row. And because we don't want any cycles to avoid infinite loops, we ignore, we won't select users that are already present in the path in here. And if you have found the friend of the previous row who is not yet in the, in the, in the path, we append it with the comma to the path, and we continue end this uh, yeah end this exercise when we find the user number four that is Jason. So if I execute this query on this data, I'll get this result. So <coughs> and then I'll see that the shortest chains between Chris and Jason is through Amy and Michelle, or for example Amy and Angela, or Amy and Jace. James. So as a summary, there are common table expressions, which are, there are non-recursive common table expressions, and they are, in my opinion, not very interesting. They're just alternative syntax for subqueries in the from clause. Although they're more readable, and in some cases, they're more optimizable. In particular, in MySQL 8, can apply this temper table reuse optimization if you use common table expressions and not subqueries in the from clause. In MariaDB, all optimizations are applied to no matter how you write it. With commentary, with CT, with subqueries, with use, it works either way. And there are recursive common table expressions, which are not alternative syntax, which are, opens a lot of new possibilities. It allows you to traverse hierarchical data like genealogy trees and graphs, like from previous example. You can data generation on the fly, which is very useful in various reports. And it actually makes, so I've heard, uh, SQL, a Turing complete language. So if you Google, you can find lots of crazy stuff you can do now with SQL with just one common table expression, how to solve Sudoku or write a brain fuck interpreter or do other crazy stuff that you never wanted. 
and probably will never want to do in SQL. So now, uh, time machine, fast forward. Next SQL standard is 2003. I, yes? Uh, do you know how, how often it's used? It's, uh, it's reasonably common. Uh, of all the major database, I think it's implemented pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So, next SQL standard, SQL 2003 introduced the concept of window functions. So, to explain what a window function is, this is my uh, completely thought of, totally non-scientific way of classifying as all the functions in SQL. There are normal functions, they return one result per row in a table, and this result depends on one row only. That is, if you have a table of 1,000 rows, you do select some function, I don't know, MD5, of some columns in this table, then you'll get a result with, with that will still have a thousand rows, but values will be different, not those values as in the original table. That's pretty simple. And there are aggregate functions, and then they return one result per group of rows. That is, again, you have this thousand row table, and you select something, I don't know, sum or average from this table, or a uh, group by A, and this A splits the table or in a hundred of in a 10 groups, 100 of rows per group, then you'll have only 10 rows in the result, not 1,000. They were all reduced to just 10 rows, and every row depends, and the value of every row depends on all those 100 rows in the corresponding group. Even if you look at this way, then window functions are somewhere in the middle, that is, they still return one result per row, but the result of the function Depends on, depends on other rows, not only this single, single row. It doesn't have this channel vision one row at a time. It sees the whole context, but still returns one result per row. And a uh, simple example to show how this works is a uh, moving average. Say you have some data which is noisy, and in this example it's number of visitors of some particular website, number of visitors a day, let's say that. And we want to see how this number of visit visitors changes over time, but we don't want to see this noise because it actually obscures the pattern. And why simple way of averaging this is to compute mo compute moving average. That is, for every po for every data point here, we take few points around it, like two po two points before and two points after. So we'll have five points. We compute the average, and we draw the value of average instead of this every do every data point. So it'll be a window of five points moving together with the current point, and we in we do, we do an average within this window, this is called moving average. And if we actually do that, the result will, be, will look like this, so it's a lot smoother and it's much easier to see the pattern. And it could be done completely at SQL. We just need to, to say the SQL, we won't compute the average over, and after over, we have a definition of the window the rows, which are two preceding rows and two following rows. So we'll have five rows around the current row, two preceding two and two following. We compute in the average within this window. This is the basic syntax for window functions. But to admit that you will really need to compute moving average in SQL, it was just a simple example. And a more practical example would be a running total. And in this example, I use a hypothetical bank and this is the table of transactions. They're not scale transactions. They are monitoring transactions which contain a transaction number, a customer ID, and amount of some hypothetical monitor units, which I will be calling coins because it's a very cool name. And this is how a, tab a transaction table looks like. So in the first transaction, the, the customer number one transfers 50 coins away from his account. And the second transaction, customer number three, transfers 50 coins into his account, and so on and so forth. And we want to, to know the balance of the every account after every transaction. That is, it'll, that is for the, after the user number one took 50 coins away, his account is minus 50. After the third user transferred 50 coins into, then his account is plus 50. Then user number one takes, transfers 50, 950 coins in, and then his account becomes minus 50 plus 950, that is 900, and so on. That's a very logical operation to do. 
if you're a bank? And how would we do that with SQL? So the question is whether it's possible to do with normal SQL without any of these funny window functions that I'm talking about. And so is it possible to do in SQL without window functions? Yeah, so in fact, it is possible. Well, this is not join the subquery. It could be converted to join, maybe. And it's not uh, even reconciled, but it's not exactly trivial either. We just, for, for every row, we need to do the sum of all rows for the same, uh, yeah. For, for, the, for every row, we need to do a sum of all amounts for all previous transactions for the, for the same user. And this is, we'll do the, this running total that we want. So what are the problems with this approach? First, it's, it's not really readable, it's not really easier to understand. Not, not, so if you look at this, you would need to, I don't know, do some kind of SQL in your head and trying to see what it's doing. So it do, does a sum for all the previous. And then you kind of build a mental image of this query, what it's doing. And your brain is searching for the concept that it corresponds to. And then finally you realize that it's actually just a running total. But the larger problem is how it will be executed in the, inside the database engine. And it will be executed exactly as it here is it written here for every row. The database engine will scan the table. It will find all the rows and it sum them. So for this row, it will scan the table. 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 So what will be the complexity of this approach? It will be n squared. That is, if you have 10 times more rows, then it will take 100 times larger to calculate the running total for the whole table. And if you have 100 times larger table, then it'll be th 10, ton, 10 times, 10,000 times, it'll take 10,000 times more time. So it, it is not a good news if you have large tables. There's an alternative approach to write this, to do this running total, to basically get the same thing using uh, window functions. With the, with the window function, we say that we, say right up front that we partition the whole rows by customer ID, that is the rest of the, window function will apply separately to different customer IDs. And then we say that we sum the all the amounts between unbounded preceding and current rows from the very beginning, unbounded preceding, and up to the current row, we do sum of the amount. And this is, by the way, one of the rare examples when SQL standard is not uh, ridiculously verbose. This is a nice example when it's not and rows between unbounded preceding and current row. This is the default behavior, so it can be dropped. You'll get a very nice and concise query. What are benefits of this approach? Now, first, it's, easy, it's small, small and easier to write, and it basically tells directly that it's running total, so you don't need to do this mapping in the head to understand what it's doing. But the main thing is it will not need to scan the table for every row, because it will work like if you have a pen and paper, you wouldn't do for every row, you wouldn't scan the whole table. You would take the previous balance and add the oper current operation. So if you transfer 100 coins into the account, you would find the previous row with the same account, take the previous balance, and just add 100. This is exactly what this approach will do with the window function. MariaDB will not do this n square operations. It will take for every row, it will take the previous account, the previous balance, and add the new operation. Because in this case, the database engine understands that you want to do a running total. So you've explained to the MariaDB that what you want to do instead of telling how to do that. And this optimizer can optimize this query much better. And I've done some totally unscientific benchmarks on my on this my very laptop. So ignore the numbers, just see how they change. And the subquery approach approach it goes very quickly becomes unknowingly slow, and then it becomes totally unusable. And then I took the liberty of adding the, in the, the, not just the index, I added the best possible index for this specific subquery, which is not something you can always do in the real world application because there may be many qu queries and you need to find some compromise. But for this benchmark, it was possible, so I just added the best possible index whatsoever for this particular approach. And index did help enormously. The query becomes 
quite usable, although still a bit annoying and slow, even at 10,000 rows, at 100,000 rows. But I bet if I go to a million, it'll be just as slow as the first one. And with the window functions, it becomes always much, it becomes always faster than subquery approach. And the execution time also grows much slower. So it'll be quite useful with million rows and with 10 million rows. This is another example how to do, uh, f f we want to find three largest transactions for every customer. And this could be practically useful, for example, for some kind of fraud prevention. And to do this, it's not quite easy to do in SQL, so there's some trick. Say we have all transactions for some, for some customer and we sorted them by the transaction size. There's the, top, the largest transaction will be on the top. The second largest transaction will be just one transaction above it. For the third transaction will be two transactions above it. And this is the trick we'll be using here. So we count number of transactions for the same customer, which are larger than current transaction. And then we say that we want only those transactions where number of large, larger transactions is less than three. That's how we can select top three largest transactions for every customer. Again, it took even me some time to explain, so it's not exactly a trivial query. With window functions, it becomes a lot easier. So again, we partition by customer ID. So what we do here, we order all transactions with, by amount decreasing. So we, and then we apply the window function called rank. And rank is just numbers all the rows, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, with the, in the order decreasing. And after that, we just select transactions where rank is one, two, or three. It's, it was a lot easier for me to explain. You don't need to think of the streak with transactions larger and so on. And again, this approach also wins the functions much faster than anything you can do with the subquery. So a summary about subqueries. Subqueries are a useful practical way to avoid window functions, a useful practical way to avoid slow subqueries and self joins. They provide better readability and what's more important than provide better optimizability because it's the query is not only easier to read for you, the query is easier to read for the optimizer. Optimizer can better understand your intentions and can optimize for them better. And that's why they're often much faster. And now fast forward to the year 2011, the next is called standard introduced the concept of system version tables. Yes. Yep. And then if if the user also works with a successor or predecessor, yeah, so, yeah, so this is a window function rank. It assigns numbers to all the all the rows in this order. That's another window function which allows you to look at the predecessor or successor. And you can use this function to do so with window functions, you define the order, then you can use a window function, a different one, which allows you to look at the predecessor in the query. So system version tables, what are they? Uh, first, I describe th three different problems that can be solved with system version tables. So I don't know whether if that ever happened to you, it does happen to me, not in a scale prompt, but in messengers, for example, but whether it happens to you or not, there's a real use case for undoing incorrect SQL commands. When you mistakenly updated something or deleted something you really didn't want to. Another use case would be doing analytics on historical data. Like there's uh, some web shop and they want to see how the user base changed since last year, whether they get more adults, more kids, the average age more male, more female, more people from that country, more people from that country. So you need to do some analytics on how the data are now and compare to how the data were some time ago. 
And the use, third use case is doing forensics on historical data. Like in here, you find some, from some logs that you had a data breach like half a year ago and nobody knew. And now there's time to do some damage control to tell users to change their passwords and to figure out what hackers actually did see back then and so on. All those problems can be solved with system version tables. Now let me show how to create a system version tables according to the SQL standard. This is a completely standard, not system version table. And SQL standard says that you need to do this. First, you need to add two columns with a timestamp uh, six, but the number six can is implementation can be implementation defined in MariaDB must be timestamp six. And the first one must be generated always as row start. The second one must be generated always as row end. The special incantations that are defined by the standard. Then you need to create a period for system time with those two column names. Column names could be arbitrary. And after that, you need to specify with system versioning. And this is, will be the standard system version tables. And we in MariaDB thought that it's a little bit too long, too much type in too, too long. And second, if you do select star, you may be don't want to see this uh, system columns, you just want to see your data by system version. So we implemented uh, an extension of the standard which allows you to omit all this crap and you just write with system version in and you get system version tables. Uh, but anyway, no matter how you do it with the standard syntax or with our extension, the question is why would you do that? And the, question, uh, the answer is if you do add system version tables, you can use this as of syntax. You still select from a table, and then you specify write for system time as of some point in time. And then you get the data that were in the table in that point in time. So this is for, for me uh, like completely magical thing. It allows you to go back in time. The data that were in, will be inserted after this point in time, that you will not see them. Data that were deleted, you'll see them again. This allows you to, to travel back in time and see how the, ta how the table looked back then at any particular point in time. And this solves all those three problems. If you, for example, deleted all the data from the table accidentally, you can just insert, insert the data into the table, selecting from this table as it was five minutes ago. And then you have all your data from five minutes ago back as, as new. And if you want to do some analytics on historical data, you can join the table T2 with table as it was in 2016. And then you can do some comparison and see what has changed. And if you found that you have had a data breach at a specific point in time that you have finally found in the logs half a, half a year after, you can select from the table at exactly this point in time, and you can see what users existed at that point in time, and you can see what users didn't change their passwords since then, and you can inform those users that they need to change their passwords. Yes, please. No, no, it does not. Hmm? According to the SQL standard, it's not possible, but we had lots of people wanting to do MySQL back, to back up MySQL dump and to be able to do that. So we have some extensions that allow to do that. So th this was SQL standard and there are some, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you if your system clock is reset, then you'll have a problem. Okay, but is there something what's happening currently in MySQL or Perl that says oh we detected that your system clock actually went bad. That's that's probably bad and you may want to do something about it. Or is it No no we no we don't have anything like that, but that totally makes sense if you report this as a bug or as a feature to jira.maribit.org, then we actually might do that. It makes sense. Good idea. So those were standard features. And now a couple of slides about our extensions. Uh, this one talks in units of time, but if you see the... And this is exactly how it actually implemented in MariaDB. But if you have transactional tables, then point in time time order doesn't actually specify that the data happened, that the data were visible at this point in time. If you have a long transaction, 
you insert something but didn't commit, and then another user connects and do select, this user will not see the data that were inserted, inserted because they were not committed yet. But just looking at the time, insert happened before the select. And to do this properly, and to see data visible as they were visible in, in a DB, this is one of our extensions. One can specify not the timestamp, but, but begin in here, and then in a DB will not store the timestamps, in a DB will store the transaction IDs. And this will allow later to do as of using character in, and get to correct transactional visibility as it happened re actually in real life. Yes. How would it impact the overall performance if you have system versions taken? Is it uh, <laughs> sensible to have this in a production environment with uh, hundreds of transactions per second? Or? So, uh, in short, we'll, so it'll obviously store more data So because you need to store those transaction IDs or timestamps. Then inserts will not be much slower. For updates, every update will need to create an old version of the row. So uh, instead of update, it'll do update and insert. Instead of de delete, it'll do update. So delete will be approximately the same and insert. Updates will be slower. And the next slide will be also about performance. So because the data are norm the historical data are normally stored in the main table. But most of the time, you actually don't want to do uh, this kind of stuff. This is something you do only rarely. Most of the time, just use the current data. And But if the history is stored together with the table, then it blows up all your indexes, and it negatively impacts the performance of normal day-to-day -day queries. And this is why we implemented the extension that allows you to store the history separately. You need to specify, use partitioning for that, and, and you do partition by system time. In, in this case, the history will be stored in separate partition. So most of the time, your day-to-day -day queries will go just to the current partition, and all this accumulated history will not slow down your day-to-day -day operations. And you can have many history partitions, and they'll be used in... It'll be, it'll, it'll be switching from partition to another according to rules that you specify. So, and this was system version tables. And the next system started was in 2016, and it introduced, finally, JSON support into SQL. Uh, long overdue, probably. So I will not talk a lot about JSON because pretty much everyone knows what JSON is. This is a standard example how you do JSON and SQL. There's, for example, a JSON query function, and the first argument is some JSON, and the second one is a way to query it, and then this is what it returns. And SQL standard introduces has those functions to work with JSON, JSON array and object to construct JSON objects, and then the exists value and query to actually query them, and JSON table to convert JSON into something that looks like an SQL table that you can select from. Although this last function is not yet in MariaDB, it's only in the latest MySQL version. But still, you can see this is a very Spartan set of functions that only allows you to do only allows to query SQL, JSON and not much else. This is why MySQL and MariaDB implemented lots of other functions to do various interesting stuff with JSON, to modify it, to query JSON metadata, and to reformat JSON for, by to print, to, for, to print, to print JSON for easier reading. Although, again, this latest set of functions is only in MariaDB and not in MySQL. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with JSON, so I won't talk much about it. And the last couple of slides is about a feature which is only in MariaDB, it's not in any SQL standard, although eventually, I don't know, it might be. It's an aggregate storage function. This is something that I think was missing for in, for in the standard for uh, quite a long time. You can do create function and create functions, and there are aggregate functions in SQL that you cannot create. That's why it's actually begging to be implemented, and there are several databases implementations that have it. There's Oracle, Oracle supports that, PostgreSQL supports that, HSQL supports that. And they have all different, in, completely incompatible syntax for that, and different set of features for that. And we, when we started implementing this, we looked carefully at all the three and trying to think which approach to use and then we decided to do what others do, that is we implemented our own incompatible syntax. 
And uh, let me explain the logic of our approach. This is completely SQL standard fun non aggregate function which selects the data from the table and com computes, fetches the data in a loop from, the, from the, this cursor and computes the sum of squares for a particular column from a particular table. And then when the table is exhausted, the continuous handler fires and then it returns the sum. So far it's nothing new, it's standard, it's not something we implemented just recently. This is completely standard and not aggregate. And yeah, the return. And this is how aggregate function, how our aggregate function looks like. So let me highlight the difference. You need to specify the aggregate keyword and you specify the argument instead of declaring it as a variable somewhere in, in the middle of the function. And there is no explicit cursor declaration anymore because there will be implicit cursor created for you that goes over the group. And instead of cursor name, you specify group fetch next row. Otherwise, the logic of the function is exactly the same as, I as if it was a standard non-aggregate function. So the concept of writing the function should be the same. You think in the same terms as if you were using, using standard SQL non-aggregate function, the same flow of logic. There's nothing new to learn here, just a, a little bit of syntax sugar and a different cursor name. And to make it more practical, this is an example that computes median completely in SQL as an aggregate user-defined function in SQL. To make it easier to read, you need to start reading from here. It creates a temporary table, then in the loop it inserts all the values of the group into the temporary table, and then continue handler fires, and then it finds the middle row and selects the middle row, drops the temporary table and returns the result. This is how you can do median completely in SQL, almost standard, user defined aggregate function. Questions? You seem to have asked everything already? No more questions? Okay, thank you.